Okay, hey guys, so uh, this is uh, Quentin Reviews, your old pal. I know it's been a good amount of time since you've seen me, unless you follow me on TikTok or Instagram or something like that. I basically decided I wanted to record this video just as kind of just of a discussion of where my life's at and how some of you have started to get worried about me, but I want you to know that everything's going really okay and really smoothly. And I just wanted to explain to you kind of my thought process with running the channel right now because I know it seems like my thought process is that I'm not running the channel but I do have, I, I've figured out what I'm doing after all these years and I've gotten a lot of comments from people being like well you know I liked it more when Quentin was running things this way and I feel like he's making himself unhappy by doing things this way and I feel, I understand what you're saying and I agree with you a little bit, but I also feel like how I've been running things these past few years has been the most content I felt about the YouTube channel. I've had other stuff in my life that's been going badly, but when it comes to just the YouTube channel, I'm actually very happy with how things have been going and I wanted to explain to you, I guess, my journey and my thought process. And maybe if some of you are kind of where I was five years ago, eight years ago, maybe you can get a little bit of insight out of this. Or maybe I just like the sound of my voice. I don't know. So at the time I'm recording this, uh, I have been doing YouTube now for about seven and a half years. This coming January will be the eight year anniversary of when I've been continuously posting. As in for the past eight years, Every month that has passed since then, I have thought of myself as a YouTuber first. Even when I've had, you know, other jobs, even when I worked at the pizza place, I always thought I'm a YouTuber and I want to be making content right now. Now, I had times where I was depressed, where I went on sabbatical, but I always thought of myself as a YouTuber. And again, this coming January, that's been the case for eight years years. Now, if you want to understand the life of a YouTuber, big or small, and you have never made YouTube content, you want to understand what it's like to be inside our brains, there's one specific thing you need to understand, and that is the algorithm. Now, the algorithm is something that gets a lot of hate, and uh, more specifically, it gets spoken of a lot in a way which implies that it could be this nebulous thing that is doing God knows what and is being run God knows how. And I know for the first few years that I was doing YouTube, based on how people talked about it, I didn't understand what the YouTube algorithm was. But I'm now a point in my career where it all makes sense, and more importantly, I'm in the good graces of that algorithm. So I'm gonna explain to you what the algorithm is from my perspective. When you open YouTube, Unless you're on a specific channel page or something similar, 90% of the time you are going to see somewhere on your screen a recommended YouTube video. That video is going to have a big thumbnail, probably a title, it might not display all the title, then it's going to have your view count information, you know, your views, and all that stuff, it's all gonna be right there at the side of your screen. Now, when you're a content creator and you have created one of those videos, which is present on somebody's screen, which is being recommended to you on your homepage or on someone else's video, when you're that creator, YouTube keeps track of how many people have had that video recommended to them in that way. And as a second number, YouTube also keeps track of the amount of people who upon seeing that video recommended to them click on the video, okay? And using those two numbers, YouTube generates uh, what is called the click-through rate. The click-through rate, or CTR, which I'm told is the thing we need to get out of our schools but I warn you, I'm mildly dyslexic. But the click-through rate, the CTR, is just one of those numbers you can find on your channel very easily. That is, they tell you your click-through rate for any video, and it's typically a lot smaller than you'd think it would be. Even the biggest YouTubers in the world, I mean, you know, it, not if you're Mr. Beast, but most YouTubers have a very small click-through rate. 
you know, often less than 5%. Often, for all the people that get shown that thumbnail and title, the click-through rate is typically like 3 to 5%, honestly, from my experience. On top of that, uh, YouTube also has like a backup feature, which they introduced, uh, I think, shortly after being bought by Google. And this feature has totally changed the platform since it was introduced. And that is a little tweak to the algorithm, where the algorithm fail uh, favors not only people clicking on videos, but also retention. And the reason that's important is if you grew up with the version of YouTube that I did, uh, you will know that that version of YouTube was very horny. <laughs> you will know that, you know, back in like 2007 to 2012, YouTube was very, very horny, everything was sexualized, and every video that went viral was almost like someone disguising a comedy video as something pornographic, and that's just what got recommended to people. Now, granted, I'm biased because, you know, I was in middle school, so that's what I was gonna click on anyways, but when they changed the algorithm so that it favored, uh, you know, not only clicks but also view time, that meant that, you know, these kind of clickbaity scammy videos were, rec you know, were a lot less successful in the algorithm because now what was important was, are people watching your video? Of course, that had this had a lot of negative side effects. The biggest one being that this meant that short form content kind of got killed off on the platform. You know, five second films, all these channels known for making, you know, very, very short content. YouTube stopped emphasizing that because it didn't make good ad money and they wanted those longer videos that had multiple ads you know that uh, they were certain weren't scams but also there was a financial element and now of course that's come back around where you have all these other websites that are based around short form content and YouTube is trying to compete with the content that they killed off. It's very ironic. But once you understand these three concepts, okay, once you understand impressions, once you understand click-through rate, and once you understand viewer retention, you will understand, you know, the base, not, not what the algorithm is, but the basic building blocks that create the algorithm. Because what the algorithm is, is the algorithm is judging you. That's what it is. The algorithm is building its own understanding of if you're good enough. And that might sound like a cynical kind of doing a YouTube eight years can answer, but that's what it is. The algorithm wants to know if you're good enough. Um, you know, base, and the way it does that is it aggregates that information. What is your click through rate? Are people clicking on those thumbnails? Are people clicking on those titles? Are people clicking on your content? And that's why, you know, th the, the thumbnail is God. You have to know how to make good thumbnails. And you have to know not only how to make content that people want to click on, you have to know how to also subtly build a brand through that. To have content which is recognizable as your own. To have thumbnails that distinctly look like a thumbnail you would make. And that's all hard stuff that, that can take years to figure out. But uh, understanding this has given me a lot of hindsight to my career. There's a lot of stuff I wouldn't have done if I understood what I was doing. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was just starting off, when it was just kind of me and Caleb, you know, living with our parents and kind of goofing around, uh, when we were just kind of doing whatever we wanted because nothing mattered, and, and we weren't going to be successful anyways, who cared? When we were just doing that, doing whatever we wanted and throwing stuff in at the wall, we, I had this really stupid idea where I wanted to turn my channel into more than a one-trick pony. And at that time, all my drama videos were blowing up. You know, like I did a video on like Leafy is Here and Grey Days Under A, and those started blowing up, and I hated making those videos. So I thought, well, what if I do some kind of thing where, like, on Fridays I can talk about other YouTubers, and then, like, on a different week I can post a movie review, and then on, like, Tuesdays I'll post a Let's Play. Now, immediately, this is a bad idea, because no matter how good all that content is, you're not going to be congregating a consistent click-through rate and watch time. But it was even worse for me because my pitch was, what if we make the worst Let's Play series of all time? 
And I thought, what if we call it passive plays and I play this character that looks like he's just on something, you know, just zoned out like he's about to fall asleep. And what if I only do let's plays of the worst material I can think of? Backs of cereal boxes, gumball machines, you know, old Thanksgiving flash games. And we ca I called it passive plays. And eventually another YouTuber gave me a tip where they were like, you gotta stop. You gotta kill this. You gotta delete those videos. Like even having those videos on the main channel was destroying my brand. <laughs> And it was destroying how the algorithm looked at me, you see. Because I had this dichotomy where sometimes I'd post... I'd post, uh, you know, like some kind of clickbaity drama video. This was early on. I was making different content. I'd post some kind of clickbaity drama video, and in 12 months or so, it'd get to a million views. Then I'd post a movie review. In 12 months ago, it'd get to like 100,000 views. And I would post one of these passive plays, and it would bomb. Like after 12 months, 500 views like really 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 bomb and what that did was it hurt everything else because the algorithm can't figure out what's going on you know because next thing i know i post a video about a youtuber and the algorithm says oh i don't know about this guy they're just the algorithm is judging me <laughs> and it's saying he posted this video before and it bombed hard and so what the algorithm does, I don't know if I've spelled this out yet, what the algorithm does is it decides how much it's going to recommend you to people. That's the very simple sh story. I should have gotten to this point earlier, I didn't. I'm not good at explaining things. But what the algorithm really does is it aggregates click-through rate and retention, and it decides, should I recommend this guy to more people? Right? And if you're someone like Mr. Beast and your retention, you know, your retention's high, your click through rate is high, everything you post gets a billion views, the moment you post a video, YouTube is going to put you in the recommendation system and the notifications of everyone it can because it knows that you consistently pull those numbers. But if you do something to weigh, to weigh your standing down, then you're not only not going to have those smaller videos do well, but you're also you're also hurting those videos that have the chance to actually do insanely well in the algorithm, to be pushed from the get-go as hard as it po they possibly can be pushed. And, you know, it took me so many years to figure out exactly what was going on, and it took me even more years to build a consistent audience where I felt like I had a brand and people saw me as a creator worth listening to, you know? Not a creator who would talk about the latest goss that would, that would, you know, diss bitch. You know, not, not the creator that would tell you about drama, that would tell you about the trending news, but a creator that you actually kind of wanted to listen to, you know, for my opinions. I took me years to actually find that audience. And the truth of the situation is that for many years, you know, every month that I could get out of bed, I was out there making these 20 to 30 minute videos where I was, you know, just pumping everything I could into it, always trying to be on those trending topics, always trying to think of something that was ahead of the game so I could anticipate what would blow up in six months, you know, always trying to make a schedule for myself for like six videos I want to get out every month and then the four that I'll actually get done in two months and I did that to myself I think for about five years you know and now it's gotten to this point where I've kind of quieted down uh, I think at this point it's been 10 months since I posted a video to my channel and it's gotten to the point where it's really weird I I occasionally have people message me and like tweet out to me and they they talk to me in a way like they think I died <laughs> they talk to me in a way like uh you know I've been set out on the river you know all it's all in the past you'll never see me again uh, and I think it's really funny because obviously 10 months for some YouTubers, including myself, that's a long time to not post content, and ideally, I'd, li I'd like to not go that long. But what I need you to understand is, you know, while it might seem like I'm pushing myself harder in order to get 
that success, which I guess I am to some extent. I also think there's a level to this where I'm more content and balanced doing what I'm doing right now. A couple years ago, um, a YouTuber gave me a piece of advice that, is, that changed my life. They completely changed my life. I met them in person and I was kind of like, hey, you've been at this far longer than I have. You've been at this since the dawn of time. What's the number one advice you'd give me? And I think he, I, I expected some kind of like meme bullshit response, but, but he, he stared straight forward at me. Like he looked me in the eyes and he gave me advice that changed my life. And the advice was this, YouTube is all about throwing things at a wall for years at a time and waiting for something to stick. But when something sticks, when you, when you home in on the landing and something works and something is really successful, you drop everything you're doing and you do that five more times. You do a video exactly like that five more times. Maybe he said a different number. Maybe he said three. To me, it's always been five. And I think when you know that, the context of what I've been doing since the start of this decade probably makes a little bit more sense. You know, the first time I tested out this advice was with a video I did that was called How Documentaries Lie to You. And this documentary was once again me trying to chase a current trend. It was me criticizing Tiger King, which I still think is one of the worst documentaries I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was criticizing Tiger King and that video blew up. And the main reason was that it was a really good title and it had a great thumbnail. And once that video blew up, I had other plans. I had other goofy, dumb things I wanted to do. But once that video blew up, I canceled videos. I threw stuff in the bin. I cleared my schedule and I said, how do I do this five more times? And that is where the History Channel Saga came from. Originally, History Channel Saga was supposed to just be one video. It was supposed to be just me making fun of History Channel. And then it naturally grew to the point where I realized, oh God, if I keep this all together, it's gonna to be like 90 minutes. A 90 minute video is not gonna do well on YouTube. So I uh, split it up at like the 40 minute mark or something like that and I called that the first video. And then I split it off into the 2012 video for part two and then bad Nazi documentaries for part three. <clears throat> and that was the most successful month of my YouTube career up to that point. I mean, the way that that worked, <laughs> the way that that worked, and it's all in the the simplicity of just the brand unity I had for those four videos, okay? And let me explain this. If you found my channel through How Documentaries Lie to You, to you if you found my channel through that video, then what happened next was you maybe clicked on my channel and said, ooh, does this guy have more videos like this? And I, I did, and it would be the video I just put out. So you'd click on that video and it would be a very similar video, except it would transition to you onto this, onto the like camcorder cut in like comedy, you know, Scott the Waz, whatever you want to call it, like, like kind of like the skits on set. And it was very similar to how documentaries lied to you, but it was a little more of like the Quidden Reviews review style. And then you'd say, man, I love this video. Is there, gonna, is there another video like this? And I'd say, hey, subscribe, because I'm working on another video like this. And then you would have, um, you would have confidence in the channel mission, in the brand. Whereas if a video of mine had blown up and you'd click on the channel and half of it had been shit post Let's Plays, you would not have had the confidence in my output. You might not have subscribed because you'd be thinking, ah, oh, this guy's going to put out a lot of content I don't want to watch, you know? But because I found that brand unity for just a couple videos in a row, I built viewers where I otherwise wouldn't have. I otherwise would have just had a viral video, you know, with no growth whatsoever, but now I had a viral video and I had people feeling confident to come on board and join the fan base. 
And I think this is a hard thing to grasp for a lot of people, you know? A lot of people will put out that video that gets two million views and then it just doesn't follow through to anything else and they're thinking, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And you can't blame them because they're young. They haven't had, you know, eight, you know, five years to figure this out or whatever. And they just don't understand uh, not only the algorithm, but how people think when they're discovering a YouTube channel, what they want to see how they want to spread their viewership to more content, you know, in kind of a very, you know, with content that's similar. Now, this is going to sound completely cynical. The iCarly miniseries was designed to be the History Channel miniseries rebooted on a bigger scale. Now, I initially didn't know the videos were going to be, you know, a thousand hours each. But what I did know was that the presentation of having a mini-series that was not interrupted by irrelevant content, having a mini-series that built up a channel identity and built up a brand confidence in the kind of material I was putting out, that had done the channel very well. And if I could find a topic where, where I knew people were going to stay invested even more than the History Channel stuff, I thought this would be very good. Um, for for me i thought that that'd be cool i thought it'd be cool if i made something people liked basically but i mean if you want to look at it like in this you know di dissect the two series right next to each other um the comparisons are mainly history channel was, was a mini series history channel was its own thing and then it started with episode zero and then it had a bonus episode months later with pawn stars so you had kind of a complete package with a prequel episode zero and a bonus episode. With the iCarly Victorious miniseries, I designed it so that the Fred video was the new episode zero. It was the new How Documentaries Lie to You. And then my intention was always once I finished the miniseries, I would do that bonus video like a few months after I'd moved on to other content. Now, if that's going to happen, I don't know. I'm not a time traveler. One thing I will tell you is I thought I'd be done with the iCarly miniseries in six months. It's been almost three years. So there you go. To some extent, I don't know what I'm doing. But what I need you to understand is when I was planning out the iCarly miniseries and I was really mapping it out fourth dimensionally, one of the first things I did was I designed test thumbnails for all the videos I thought I was going to do, which was a lot fewer videos in the beginning. I think originally it was going to be four videos. Now it's more than four. But I designed all these thumbnails, like an iCarly thumbnail, a little Victorious thumbnail, and going all the way through the story, and my whole thought was, when I finish this miniseries and all these thumbnails are on the channel in a row, it is going to look so good and so satisfying. And no matter what, getting to the end of that miniseries and having all of these thumbnails in a row, that is worth it at the end of the day. Because I really believed in that mission. I believed in creating something cool, you know, that would, you know, create kind of a new channel identity for me in a really exciting way. And I guess people, uh, I've been talking about how I've had some stuff not go good in my life. It was mainly a lot of personal stuff that uh, had nothing to do with the channel, I want to explain. But people have occasionally, you know, kind of read into my life and read that I'm stressed and I'm anxious and I'm pushing myself. And you're completely right. All those things are true. <laughs> I mean, uh, working on a video for 10 months straight and just accepting that the only feedback I'm going to get is people on Discord and Patreon, and otherwise it's going to be my weird little pet rock monster. That's been a weird experience for me, and sometimes it can get really hard to stay motivated. But on, you know, you know, at the other side of things, I need you guys to understand the two sides of things, and how right now, I'm a lot happier when it comes to the channel than I used to be. Because I thought the worst part about running a YouTube channel as a small creator and doing it full time but not being a thousand percent financially stable was just the rush of living paycheck to paycheck. Because that was always so hard. And specifically what I hated was having to run around and try to be topical. And to try and stress about, oh, is this a topical thing to talk about? 
is this the thing that's going to be smart to talk about in four months if I start working on it now? Oh, this thing just blew up, you know, should I stop and should I try and cover it right now? So when I have people say to me, oh, you know, I miss like 2019 Quentin, I miss like 2018 Quentin. Uh, you know, I miss when Quentin would put out these spontaneous 20, 30 minute videos about a topic like the Mr. Peanut video or this video or that video. And first of all, those videos took a long time to blow up. <laughs> uh, and second of all, I am, I have been watching the whole world as I've been working on this project. I've been staying invested in the news. I've been staying invested in everything. Honestly, I'm still a little bit addicted to Twitter. I need to try and log off sometime. And I was thinking about the other day how grateful I am that I don't have to do the bullshit that I used to have to do. You know? Because imagine if if the iCar if if History Channel had never blown up, if the iCarly series had never blown up. You know, if my life had never been changed by these projects in such a way, then I would be out there being like, Quentin Reviews, huh, look at these titanic billionaires and their stupid submarine. You know, and I'd be making like a little like analytical video about the billionaire sub in the submarine at the Titanic. And at some point I'd talk about the yellow submarine for like 15 minutes, just cause I really like that movie, but I never get to talk about it. And it would just be like really weird and clickbaity. And then I, and then, and then, you know, uh, Miranda sings just, uh, she just, her, her life is, uh, blowing up right now. She's apparently a groomer or, and a bad person and monetized the sexuality of her, her underage fans. And when she got called out for it, she did an apology video on a fucking ukulele. Like, I would be doing a reaction video to that right now if I was the same person I was five years ago. You know, and, and all this other stuff. The Grimace Shake. Right now, I could be making a Grimace Shake ARG analysis video. And the thing about those videos is you're looking at me and you're going, Quentin. You can still do those videos. Just do those videos and put them out on the main channel. It won't matter. But this is the part where it is stressful. And and it's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. And I just, I, I wish people understood this more. Because the bad thing is I don't really want to make those videos. I made videos like those because I had to. I felt like I had to stay on top of current trends, you know. I had to be topical and cool because I was trying to get the algorithm to think I was a cool guy. And now I don't have to do that anymore because the algorithm has, has already aggregated that if I put something out, it's probably going to do well because I have this consistent series going on right now. And then the other side of it is, let's say I decide I want to do a video analyzing the Grimace Shake. But by the time I finish doing it, everyone is done talking about it. And it, you know, it's taken me too long and it's a dead meme by then. And I put it out and it gets a hundred thousand views. To some of you that sounds like a dream, but I've had nightmares about doing that. I've had nightmares about putting out a spontaneous video and it gets 50,000 views. And then I get to look at it and I get to be like, well, there it goes. That I had, you know, I had a good rapport with the algorithm and now the algorithm knows I'm a hack. And now the algorithm knows that not everything I do is going to get a million views. That's always a fear in mine now that I might turn out to be not good enough because I struggled for so many years to find content that was relative. And I, sometimes I felt like I was jumping between a new personality every week, just trying to throw stuff at a wall. And now I feel like I have some consistency in my life, some stability and I'm one, I'm one video that kind of sucks away from destroying everything from my perspective. And the reason that the iCarly miniseries has changed my life so much is that I'm caught in this weird loop that's very positive with it, where I haven't posted a video in 10 months and I, it, the, people are still watching that, vic, that victorious two-parter. People are still watching that video right now to this day, even though I haven't put out a video in 10 months. And as much as it stresses me out to work on some of these videos, I need you to understand like the freedom that comes with just a, a perpetual energy machine that's just purring in the background. And if I want to take 10 months off and work on something kind of cool, 
so I can finally reveal it at some point. I'm working on more than one project, by the way. I'm allowed to do that because, I, because I'm not going to go bankrupt because people are still watching that video. But if I post a video that had, gets 50,000 views, that perpetual energy machine might shut off. I'm pointing to my other laptop, which is the good one that I actually use to look at the channel. And I think, I think that's the, that's the angle of it that people don't look at. Like, sure, I am currently forcing myself to be stuck in a particular kind of content, but the liberation of that, the liberating feeling where I can slow down and maybe go as long as a year without posting new content, it is so liberating and so better than just running a marathon every single month and always feeling like I got to think of the coolest thing ever because back when I was trying to appease the algorithm and I was like struggling to get videos to a hundred thousand views, you know, back then I, I really felt like I, w I was weeks away from quitting at any particular time. And I think the big lesson here is that when you're a content creator, and I look at a lot of you guys out there and you're just starting off and you're real young. Maybe you're like I am. Maybe you just got out of high school and you're working, you know, at a pizza place. And they're making you spin the sign at the side of the highway and they won't let you cook the fucking pizza. Maybe you're, maybe that's who you are right now and you want to be a content creator. One of the big pieces of advice I can give you uh, actually has nothing to do with like the idea of success. Because I've given you, throughout this video, I think I've given you a pretty good worldview as per what the algorithm is and how to build, like, how to get the algorithm confident in you, how to get your audience confident in you. But one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you is when you're just starting out, know where you are in your career and know what, what you're allowed to do now that you won't be allowed to do maybe if you're really successful one day. You know, if you're just starting off, if you're not getting, you know, any views on your content at all, just find one person in your life that will sit down and watch your videos with you. Make a video, try and make that person laugh or try and make that person think and then watch the video with them and let that be your viewer experience. And at that point in your career, relish the ability to make content that's for you or for you and your friend in such a way that a general audience would not like that video. <laughs> because today I get all these people tell them, telling me like, oh my God, can you go back to doing those Rankin Bass reviews? Can you go back to reviewing Herbie movies? And it's like, I don't know if I can because you know, I'm just, I'm honestly scared of destroying my channel. But I still look back on those days. I wouldn't erase them for a moment, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't not make a video that was just for me that I knew I was making because I was doing so badly that I couldn't fail. You know, videos like my, I did a video about the Back to the Future spinoffs. I wouldn't make that video today because it would do badly like it did. But because at that point the channel wasn't doing well, I was able to do whatever I wanted. And that was such a creative, fun thing. Just being able to be like, I'm going to make this video that nobody's going to watch but me. And then one day, people are going to turn around and they're going to say, why doesn't he make this video anymore? And that's the real complexity of it, I guess. I just wanted you guys to, to understand the nuance here. And this is why so many YouTubers, when they blow up, they run to the second channel. They, they boot up the second channel like a lawnmower and they say, let's make the stupidest content we've ever seen just for the second channel. Because there is a duplicity to this. It is so liberty to know that if you're patient and you put in the good work and you're consistent to what your audience expects, you will do well and you will be rewarded. But it, it is also liberating to do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> and so that's why having a main channel that's very specific to a brand to a point of just sitting there and rotting... <laughs> while having a second channel where you do that fun, goofy stuff and you don't care about the metrics, that is having your cake and eating it too. And I thought if I recorded this video real quick, maybe, maybe I could reach out to you guys and tell you guys, I'm not dead. I'm doing pretty great, I think. The video is coming soon. It's probably going to be 12 hours or more. 
don't tell YouTube I can upload past 12 hours. But the video's coming soon and I'm working real hard on it. And I might get some more second channel content out now. But for now, I'm doing real good. I'm not dead. And I'm so happy to hear from you guys. With that, I've been Quentin Re 2s and that's all you needed. Or whatever I say on this channel, I don't know. <laughs>